So my name is Colin Soze. I'm a research software engineer with the National Oceanography Centre. And we've got two projects here that we want to talk to you about that we've used um, Jasmine for both of them. So the first I'll talk about is the um, Hague for us digital twin. And the second that Joao will talk about is an example with some ocean circulation models. So um, those who don't know, Hague for us is a small marine protected area located off the, the west coast of Cornwall. It's quite a unique area because it's a raised rocky outcrop that has a lot of species that are not found anywhere else on the surrounding seabed. And um, most of the surrounding seabed is quite flat, featureless sand, and this is a rocky bit, so there's lots of interesting species that only live there. And there is a need to monitor this area, and we've been working with um, JNCC, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, I think I've got the name right, um, to um, build a digital twin that helps to visualize and um, model some of the data around this site. And one of the big challenges, we have a lot of big, um, both raster and data file and vector files. So we have um, a large amount of underwater imagery taken by our submarines and a bit also taken by drop cameras, which are cameras on the end of a, a wire that are dropped down. And we also have some vector data, which is things such as um, seabed composition and where certain species have been sighted. And then a lot of um, smaller data with things such as species observations and locations of where they were found. So our big challenge, first big challenge was getting um, the raster data in. And for that, we've been using the cloud optimized GeoTIFF format. If you're not familiar with this, GeoTIFF is a, a variation on TIFF, which is basically a georeference TIFF file that says what the, the latitude and longitude of the, the edges of the image are. Um, but cloud optimized GeoTIFF adds an extra dimension to this in that it has multiple sort of zoom levels of that image within it and allows you to just transfer subparts of it. So there are in multiple layers um, stored within there. And this means that you can request just a subpart of that image and not bring back the whole thing, which is very useful when you've got multi-gigabyte files and you want to view them in a web browser and you don't want to transfer multiple gigabytes of data back to an end user. Um, so key to this is the HTTP um, get range request, which allows you to request a subpart of a file over HTTP. So with a cloud optimized GeoTIFF, there's a, a small header that maps out everything inside the file. You get that, and then from that header, you can then work out which ranges you want to request based on what your client is clicking on and which bit of the um, image they're trying to view. It's quite easy to make one of these if you've got an existing um, GeoTIFF file or many other popular formats. So if you use libraries such as um, GDAL, you can convert these relatively easily. And then if you put them onto the Jasmine object store, that has HTTP range request support built into it. So then you can build clients around that that work directly off the object store. Um, vector data can be a bit more complicated because it can be harder to sort of predict where in a file um, the data of interest is, and it's a bit harder to, to map things out. We found two possible solutions that were tailored for vector data, one called um, flat geobuff, and the other was called um, MB tiles. So flat geobuff is very much focused around having a very high performance binary encoding. Um, it was created by Google, but they've now open sourced it. Um, but we found it didn't scale so well to really large files um, of the nature that we were using. So it looked like an interesting technology, and I think for certain use cases, it would be great, but it wasn't what we needed for this project. So the other thing we looked at was MB tiles. MB tiles actually works by having um, tiled data stored in a set of SQL light files, and then produces indexes within these. And um, we found that one MB task file can represent a single um, data set, but you can also have multiple tile sets within multiple files. And then again, you can place these um, onto the object store and using the, the magic of range requests, just get the, the subparts that are needed. So our, our digital twin, we tried very hard to not build any sort of server-side APIs that would have to run on a VM, and we failed in the end. So we were hoping that we could build everything where we would just have some JavaScript that would talk directly to the object store, and we would never have to have anything sat in between. Um, one problem we really found was with the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, although you can do this range requesting and the JavaScript can talk quite well to that and pull out the right bits, the way it chunked it was not 
that efficient and going through an intermediate tile server, which split the request up into small chunks actually worked more efficiently. So we ended up spinning up a tile server, which is just a, a Docker container on a, a Jasmine cloud, um, um, a managed cloud instance. And MB tiles also need its own server. So there's a, another one running in the MB tile server. And then actually for some of the other data types we had, where we had um, things like the observation data, there were some biodiversity calculations we had to do. And we're still talking multiple megabytes of CSV that some of these had to work through. And it wasn't practical to transfer that to the client and do that client side. So we ended up building a small API that allowed us to process those. But we've still probably done 80-ish percent maybe of the work um, works directly or directly via a tile server to the object store. Um, I think I just covered all that. So now I will attempt the fabled live demo. Um, so we also wanted to keep this running while Jasmine was down. We actually moved it all to Oracle Cloud. So we spent quite a while trying to build I've just realized this isn't going to work because I can't remember my passwords and I have to log in to get to it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, yeah, it does work. <laughs> um, and I said, we, we moved it to Oracle Cloud while Jasmine was down. And I looked up the, the costs the other day, and I think we've been paying about seven or eight pounds a day to Oracle to keep this running. And that's for about 100 gigabytes of data in the object store and a couple of virtual machines that are running 24 seven. We investigating the sort of magic serverless architectures that some of the commercial clouds do where you can essentially create functions in the cloud that spin up a VM when they run and then shut down again. And a lot of people run tile servers in this way. And that's something I've been intrigued to know if Jasmine could support in future because from what we've seen of the, the current provision that wasn't possible. So we just left VMs running all the time. And what we've realized in transitioning to Oracle is that we've built a solution that maybe isn't so cloud native in the way it's done, but fitted very nicely with the Jasmine architecture. And it did actually transfer quite well to Oracle. And in fact, that cloud non, that non cloud native approach is actually cheaper in Oracle cloud, but maybe doesn't scale so well. So we built everything into a set of Docker containers and we wrote some rules in salt that will set um, provision our VMs. Whereas the, the Oracle cloudy way to do it is to run everything serverless and have Kubernetes autoscalers that can scale it all up. But actually just having one autoscaler costs more than having one VM, even when you haven't run anything scaled out from it. Okay, I'll now hand over to Joao to talk about some of the other bits we've done. So my name is uh, João Morado. I work as a research software engineer at the National Oceanography Center. And in this part of the presentation, I'll be focusing on uh, cloud solutions tailored to store uh, data sets that are generated through the simulation of ocean general circulation models. So there are several challenges that must be addressed to make these uh, data sets easily accessible in the cloud and publicly available. Some approaches to address these challenges were already uh, mentioned in uh, previous presentations during this conference, but I hope uh, that uh, I'll bring uh, some insight into different ones that could also be applied. So first and foremost, uh, we must determine what's the most uh, uh, suitable data format for our needs. Um, so these data sets usually have hundreds or uh, thousands of NetCDF files, which sum up to terabytes of data. So we must decide if we want to keep them in their original form then use a library such as Kershank to aggregate these multiple NCD files into a single virtual data set. But if, on the other hand, we want to convert all the data into a cloud native data format such as ZAR, uh, we must also decide on what's the best uh, chunking strategy to follow. Uh, this was already covered also yesterday because the way in which we chunk the data uh, has an impact on the efficiency of the operations we perform on the data sets. And the third challenge revolves around the, the transfer and update of these data sets uh, and how we can make this as efficient as possible. So I'll, I'll discuss all these three challenges and I'll start by talking a bit about uh, our decision regarding data formats. Uh, this should be uh, quite uh, popular by now, but yeah, ZAR is uh, one of the most uh, 
widely used um, cloud native data formats because it is open source. It can be used uh, to storage a chunk, compress and dimensional arrays that can be stored in the disk or memory, S3, etc. It allows for fast and parallel access to array data and it integrates with popular Python libraries such as uh, NumPy, uh, Dask, XArray, etc. So the figure on the right shows the, the structure, the typical structure of a ZAR dataset. And in the ZAR file format, it's, um, the data of each array is uh, stored as a set of compressed binary uh, chunks, and each chunk is written to its own file. And basically, this differs fundamentally from uh, other cloud native data formats uh, like cloud optimized geotiff that uh, Colin has just talked about, in which you have a single object that can handle multiple HTTP get re uh, run requests. Whereas uh, in ZAR, we have uh, multiple objects, uh, each of which is obtained with a single get, and this can be then potentially uh, asynchronously. Another option to make these data sets accessible through the cloud is using the Carchunk library. Uh, it offers a unified approach uh, to aggregate uh, files, for example, netcdf files, grip2 files, tiff files. And it provides efficient access to this data uh, and does this by extracting relevant information, such as uh, byte ranges, compression details, and other metadata about the data. All of these is stored in JSON files that comply to the uh, ZAR format. And then, well, the metadata files can describe uh, data that spans multiple files of, in the same data format, but uh, this is not uh, res restrictive in the sense that, uh, so it can also aggregate uh, files that are in different data formats, which I think is quite useful. And considering the prevalence of uh, data sets that are currently uh, produced as NetCDF files, uh, Kershaw provides cl cloud-optimized access to these without the need to convert to more cloud-native data formats such as ZAR. So at this point, both uh, ZAR and Kershaw seemed quite uh, suitable options for storing the ocean situation models in the Jasmine object store. So the next step was to identify uh, which one performed the best and also what was the optimal chunking strategy to follow. Uh, to do this, we started from a data set of seawater salinity, which has four dimensions, so one temporal one and three spatial ones. And we generated several data sets with varying chunking options. So the data sets in the red box uh, preserved the chunking that was pre present in the original NetCDF files. Uh, and we created one in the ZAR format, and for the other one, we used the Kerchunk library. The data sets in the black box are all in ZAR format, and we use the core search chunking for the X and Y dimensions. And um, we kept that uh, as equal to, the, to all data sets and try different chunking schemes for the time and for the depth dimensions. And finally, the data sets in the green box uh, are also in the ZAR format, and we did not chunk the X and Y dimensions in these ones. And we use always the, uh, the same chunk size uh, for the depth dimension. And the time uh, we chunked it uh, either monthly or quarterly. So we stored all these data sets in the Jasmine object store and then uh, used Lotus to uh, compute some properties. So, the operations we carried out were to calculate the annual mean depth profile of a grid point, the specific green point, the annual mean of the surface layer, the area average for the full, for the 12 months, and the depth average for the for the 12 months as well. Uh, so, for example, when calculating the annual mean depth profile at a specific green point, we mainly need access to the depth and time dim uh, dimensions, whereas this became less important when calculating the annual mean of the surface layer where the X and Y dimensions are the fundamental part. So I think the main uh, takeaway from this slide is that uh, uh, these results show that the Kershank dataset, which is represented in blue, gives lower performance than its ZAR counterpart in, in absolute terms, of course. Uh, and for now, this led us to discard uh, Kershank uh, and focus on ZAR. And while well, we had several options because uh, it, it was a bit hard to decide uh, which ZAR 
uh, data set performed best, but in the end we opted uh, uh, for a data set with the finest granularity where we had one value per time uh, dimension, five values per depth, and uh, 577 values for the X and Y dimensions, because this has allowed us to keep the files uh, with a small size. Uh, and we noticed that this increases uh, performance to just a few megabytes, basically. Um, furthermore, we also assess the parallel strong scaling on a single node uh, with 16 cores. These results are shown in the top figure and uh, evaluated the parallel strong scaling on multiple nodes. Uh, and these results are shown on the bottom figure. Here it's important to note that uh, while Kerchank did not, did not perform that well in terms of its scaling uh, when uh, using just a single node, uh, it uh, approached a asymp asymptotic equivalence with ZAR uh, when the, as the number of cores increased. And uh, well, this kind of corroborates the claim of the uh, creators of Kerchunk. So it does approach asymptotic equivalence. And uh, while it is in absolute terms slower than ZAR, it can still be uh, used for, uh, uh, can be still a viable approach to um, aggregate uh, uh, net CDF files uh, as a single virtual data set. Uh, in the Jasmine object store. Also, uh, the parallel efficiency uh, range from approximately 90 to, uh, 50 to 90% for most data sets when using just one node. Uh, well, trivially, we did not get any speed up when the number of cores uh, was greater than the number of chunks. And uh, the chunking scheme we decided to use and that I mentioned in the previous slide is the one shown here in, in green, as a, so the, the green line, uh, which exhibits uh, quite good uh, uh, parallel strong scaling uh, and uh, yeah, confirms that uh, it was a, a good choice. So at this point, we have decided that we were going to use uh, ZAR instead of Kerchunk. And we also knew uh, what was the chunking strategy that we were going to follow. So the third challenge that we still needed to address was how to uh, automatically uh, update these data sets on the object store. And uh, for this uh, purpose, we developed the pipeline, uh, which is a Python library designed to create bespoke data pipelines. So um, it is a general customizable and extendable software that can automate the extraction, uh, transformation, and updating of data sets uh, and it integ integrates with parallel libraries. And for example, to transfer two terabytes of data to the Jasmine object store, uh, it took us approximately eight hours using two nodes, 16 cores per node and four cores per file. Uh, and you can see that uh, the kind of uh, uh, scheme, uh, transfer scheme that we um, were trying to achieve here is very similar to the near line uh, approach that was presented earlier today. Um, and just to finish, so now we have these data sets publicly available uh, in the Jasmine Object Store, and they can be accessed using tools such as X-Ray, uh, NetCDF, etc. I think the advantage of uh, uh, X-Ray is that it can be, used, can be used almost as a black box because everything, uh, all the complexities are hidden uh, under the hood. Uh, so, um, but... Um, other tools can also be used, such as NetCDF, which is uh, also uh, under development and uh, will have some interesting features uh, in the future. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, we are happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions for either the I um, break off with a few. Um, I have a question for Charles. Yeah. I'm still getting my head around the thing, so I'm not understanding it very clearly. But if the net city, if the original net city of file is chunked in a different way, and then you create your chunk libraries, 
does that affect speed or it doesn't matter how the original let's say, uh, yeah i think it uh, so the the way the original SDF chunk is the original SDF file, SDF file is chunk uh, is important so if you um basically you can use either x-ray or rechunker to uh, transform that uh, and just rechunk the net CDF file uh, to another chunking scheme and then you use care chunk as the next step so smaller bite size pieces the better performance yeah so i would say uh, for usually uh, i noticed that net CDF chunks tend to be smaller than the optimal size for dask i would say that for dask around between uh, so we did some experiments that I'm not showing here, but between 10 and 30 megabytes uh, seem to be uh, give the best performance. That's yeah. great, thanks. Thank you. So this work on, on testing Zara and Kachunk and, and trying out the different sizes, that's really impressive. But um, how much does it generalize to um, because now that we're talking about net zero and having the most efficient use of our computing resource, you really want, in principle, every project to fine tune their data access and their chunking and their um, all, all their stuff so that it runs as efficiently as possible with a with like tightly optimized code. Yet there is also not everyone can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. They may not have enough time. They may not have skills. They may not have the um, the tools that they need to do this. So how much does your work generalize to, like, can you use that to guide other projects to the most efficient use of Jasmine, for example? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question and a hard one, I would say, because uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, of course, uh, in absolute terms, the results will be always different depending on the system uh, from which you are well doing these tests. But I would say that there are some, uh, some general guidelines that uh, do not differ too much between systems. Uh, one is uh, uh, regarding the, um, the chunk sizes. So we shouldn't go uh, use anything below 10 megabytes, I would say. And you should also go for very large chunk sizes. I'm recommending like 30 megabytes or something, but yeah, above 100 megabytes, let's say, it's it's really not recommendable. Uh, another important aspect uh, is, of course, um, so the, the way in, in which you chunk the data uh, uh, is uh, influences the performance of the operations that you are going on the data set. And I think that is really uh, uh, per case, uh, <laughs> decision because uh, in uh, it really depends on the kind of applications and the kind of operations are more so the what are the mo uh, most popular operations that are performed on those data sets so to speak so uh, i think uh, uh, if you want to achieve uh, um, some kind of uh, equilibrium between uh, operations that uh, uh, have to access chunks on the time and depth dimension and at the same time operations that uh, want so need to access time and uh, x and y dimensions so i would uh, recommend uh, uh, for sure something that uh, partitions uh, things uh, it's 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 very dependent but i would say you should always partition the depth dimension for sure, uh, and uh, your uh, x and y domain as well. And for example, here we were using one month. Uh, uh, each chunk corresponded to one month, but if you, for example, as it was shown yesterday, if you have a data set that spans several years, I wouldn't uh, use. So my chunks would probably be like three months or six months, something like that. So that's, it, it's very hard to, um, to find a, a solution that fits uh, all possible uh, operations that can be done on a data set. Uh, but usually, um, yeah, 
I think you should have like some as many chunks as possible as long as they are not very small. Point. But but the project so taking the project from yesterday, would you recommend they go through the same exercise? I think uh, we uh, 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 reached very similar conclusions actually. So in terms of chunking, uh, optimal chunking strategies, etc. I think our conclusions are aligned. Any other questions? The um, cross-node parallel scaling results are really interesting, um, comparing um, Kitchen versus Czar. Yeah. Have you looked into why there is the difference? Um... Not really. Uh, so I suspect uh, uh, it's because accessing the chunks in the net CDF is not as fast as accessing the ch the individual so files. So you get more scaling just because it's slower in the first case. Yeah, but uh, the real. So I haven't done any profiling, so to speak, of this, uh, and uh, to understand exactly where is the the bottleneck for the for the care chunk. Uh, uh, access uh, but uh, yeah i think the interesting thing is that it does uh, approach asymptotic equivalence with that as it is claimed on the website which is good <laughs> yeah thank you so but i haven't uh, uh, understood exactly what is uh, the part that causes the lower performance for as the number of uh, cores Decreases, so to speak. 